Good morning. My name is Tom Belshi. I'm the Deputy Director of the League of Arizona Cities and Towns, and welcome to another installment of our webinar series. This one is in concerning the incorporation process in Arizona. What the incorporation process means is the process by which an unincorporated area becomes a city or a town. And uh, what I'm presenting here today is the process that we talk about with the proponents of incorporation, the proponents and, um, and opponents in public meetings um, about how they go about incorporating their area. The first thing that we do is we talk to them about what the prerequisites are for incorporation. And uh, the first one is population based. You have to have at least 1500 people in order to incorporate. And uh, if you do have 1500 people, you can incorporate as a town. If you have at least 3000 people, you can incorporate as a city. Now, um, part of the incorporation process is if you are over 3,000 um, is deciding also whether you're going to incorporate as a town or a city. Um, the only difference in Arizona law as to why uh, you designate yourself as a city or a town is that a, a city may adopt a charter. And uh, we may do a webinar series later on the process for uh, becoming a charter city or town. But for right now, that is the only real difference uh, between a charter city and, uh, or a city and a town. Uh, the other prerequisite for incorporating is that a, a, an area must be a community. And that means that their population must live in uh, proximity with each other. They have to have services in common. Uh, so many of the areas they consider incorporation um, may even have uh, community uh, boards. Uh, they have uh, fire districts, uh, maybe county road districts, uh, water districts. Uh, they have, have uh, act as a community together. Um, and there also has to be no large tracts of uninhabited land. Now, the important thing uh, that you should know about the definition of being a community and no large tracts of uninhabited land is that uh, no real definition has been placed on, on those items. That's largely if an incorporation was to be challenged. Those are largely subjective and would be decided by the courts. Um, but um, uh, if all three items are met, uh, population, uh, community and there are no large tracts of uninhabited land. The next thing that that you have to take a look at is what we refer to as the three and six mile rule. And what this rule says is that if you are a community of uh, over uh, or if you draw your boundaries in uh, for your incorporation and any part of those boundaries is within three miles of a city or town under 5,000, or if you're within six miles of a city or town over 5,000 uh, people, then you must receive a resolution from that city or town approving uh, your um, desire to go forward with petitions or elections for incorporation. Now, there are some exceptions uh, to that rule. For example, um, if you are a city or town over 15, or if you're an unincorporated area that includes over 15,000 people in your uh, proposed incorporated boundaries, and the city or towns that are cons you are uh, located near uh, within three or six miles are less than that, um, you don't need their permission to incorporate. And so um, that was a change in state law not long ago. The next thing that we uh, talk about is the methods for incorporation. Now there are two methods. Uh, one is called petition without election and one is the petition with election. Now petition without election simply means that when you take um, the registered voters within your proposed incorporated boundaries 
and you get two thirds of those registered voters to sign a petition, then there's no need for an election. Um, the issue goes directly to the County Board of Supervisors and they order uh, the incorporation. Now, there's only one instance uh, of uh, the cities and towns that have incorporated in the state where that has happened. And that is the, the small community of Star Valley, which is located near Payson, Arizona. The rest of the cities and towns have incorporated by using the petition with election process. And that is the incorporated boundaries. You get 10% of the registered voters to sign the petition and then an election is held. And if 51% of the people voting at the election, not of the registered voters, but 51% of the people voting at the election vote for incorporation, then uh, the County Board of Supervisors orders the incorporation. Another interesting uh, fact is, is that because a council cannot be uh, selected at that first election, until you are able to have a regular election as a new city or town council, the County Board of Supervisors picks the first council. Um, and uh, that, um, again, happens until you're able to set up those elections in the future. Um, city responsibilities. Once you've become incorporated, there are things that you must do as a city or town, and there are three general things. Um, you are res responsible for providing police protection, for uh, maintaining the county roads at the same level that they are now maintained, and providing administration. So let's talk about those three individually. Uh, police uh, costs are gonna be at least 50% of the general fund budget. It's the most expensive service that is provided. And, um, and so one of the things that, that we tell uh, newly incorporated cities or towns is that uh, the easiest, most efficient and most cost effective way to handle police in the beginning when you're newly incorporated is to contract with the county to do just that. And so um, that is uh, what the vast majority of cities and towns uh, that are newly incorporated do. The roads, uh, again, must be maintained as the, as the same as the county level of maintenance. Um, again, this is another way uh, in which to be most cost effective and efficient is to have the roads continue to be maintained through contract, such as the police, with the county um, until such time that uh, uh, you can take over uh, the maintenance yourselves. Now, the fact of the matter is for most road uh, construction and maintenance, um, those things by state law have to be um, uh, contracted out with private entities. Although the counties and the cities and towns are able to do some of the work on their own, uh, basically what that would be doing is taking over the contracting portion of that. But again, in the beginning, as you're learning how it's going to be done, um, we always suggest that that's done um, through the county. Also, administration uh, means that um, the basically several different services that have to be provided through uh, kind of a, a city or town presence. Now, the reason that I say that is the city has to provide some kind of office hours. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a city hall or something like that. I remember that with the town of Sawarito when they were first uh, incorporated, they operated out of the, um, the newly hired clerk's home in the beginning. Um, there has to be a place that citizens can come and, uh, and talk with the city or town. There has to be regular office hours. There has to be a place where your candidates for office can come and pick up their candidate registration forms. And um, there has to be a place where um, they can come and if they, uh, uh, if the city or town is gonna to provide some kind of services that have to be licensed or if they're gonna provide a utility has to be paid for, all of those things have to have some place where people can come and actually do that. The first and most important service that you'll have to hire for is an attorney. Uh, unfortunately, 
when cities and towns are formed and then they become a government, then um, the uh, cities are sued and um, they have legal forms that they have to do and they have ordinance that they they have ordinance to be prepared and passed. And that work is all done by the city or town attorney. Now, uh, the attorneys uh, in the beginning, uh, we recommend to the proponents of incorporation that they have some kind of, of legal advice. And so we provide them the names of some attorneys that we know work in this area and uh, will often provide their services pro bono. Uh, with the idea that they might perhaps become uh, the new city or town attorney later on. Uh, of course, there's no contract made or anything like that. Um, it's uh, basically by working with the new community, they may form a relationship that, can, that uh, is beneficial for both later on. Um, also, we talked about the importance of having a clerk. Also, um, one of the things that has to happen with uh, the new administration is the purchase of liability insurance. Um, unfortunately, again, when you become a uh, uh, community or city or town and you're a legal entity, um, you're going to be sued and having liability insurance, insurance is very important. Um, the league uh, works with a, a nonprofit organization that um, provides liability insurance to uh, 71 of our incorporated cities or towns, and we always provide um, uh, proponents um, with the information regarding uh, liability insurance. That's pretty much it for city responsibilities. You may notice that there are cities and towns that provide a lot more services than we have listed here. Uh, some of them have, may have parks and recreation. Some of them may have um, uh, fire departments. Um, again, those are things that are decided on uh, later on and uh, those are uh, services that may be requested by the citizens of the community. And again, uh, they have to be budgeted and they have to find a way to pay for them. And so these are the things that are absolutely mandatory uh, for, for uh, cities and towns to do. But obviously there are a number of other services that they can be, uh, that they can be um, a part of and that they can have as part of uh, the menu of services that they provide to their citizens locally. Now, in order to carry out the mandatory services, um, there are revenues available to cities and towns. We start out by talking about the federal level. It used to be that the federal uh, government provided uh, a lot of money to cities and towns, especially uh, in the area of infrastructure development. There's very little money of that left. The most common and well-known form of uh, federal uh, government help is the Community Development Block Grant Program. And uh, it still exists today. Uh, that money is determined how it is determined to be used and uh, how it um, is divided up amongst the cities and towns and counties in the state is determined through a process that usually is a part of what we call the council of government process. In the state, there are six councils of government. Um, they're, they're made up of councils that are formed uh, with elected officials from county, uh, city, town, and, and tribal governments. And, and, uh, and at least some kind of process by which people make applications for that grant money, and it is distributed um, amongst the cities and towns in that county. Um, then uh, the most common and robust system of revenues for cities and towns in Arizona is what is referred to as the shared revenue program. There are four types of shared revenues. Uh, there is urban revenue sharing, sales tax, highway user revenue fund, and vehicle license tax. I'm going to take each one in turn. Uh, the urban revenue sharing is really um, cities and towns share of the state income tax. When the state collects its income tax, cities and towns receive 15% of what the state collects, and that goes directly to cities and towns, and then it is distributed based on um, the latest census estimate 
that is provided by the Census Bureau. Now that's not the census figure, that's not the, uh, but it is the census estimate that is updated on a yearly basis. Uh, a total is prepared for all the incorporated city and town population in the state, and then a percentage for each city and town is determined, and the money for um, uh, the state shared sales tax is divided that way. The state sales tax is divided uh, by population in exactly the same way as the urban revenue sharing is. Now, what's, uh, the state sales tax is cities and towns get a portion of the state sales tax. There is a base created um, in state law and cities and towns receive 25% of that sales tax. And again, it is distributed in the same way as I described with um, urban revenue sharing. The next uh, form of shared revenue is the highway user revenue fund. Now this is the gas tax that is collected. This is the 18 cents per gallon uh, that is collected and um, uh, used for uh, specifically um, road maintenance. Now urban revenue sharing and state sales tax can be used for any government purpose, any public purpose um, that cities and towns use. It, it goes to their general fund and is used for all those things that, that we talked about earlier. Um, the highway user revenue fund is, used, is dedicated in state law specifically to the maintenance of, um, of public roads and the right of way. So they can be used for repair, maintenance, and construction of um, of streets mostly and anything that's in uh, the right of way, so sidewalk, curb, and gutter, um, all of those kinds of things. Now, because the Highway User Revenue Fund hasn't been increased in a number of years and some of the money out of the fund has been swept to pay for other services, HERF um, has basically become mostly a repair and maintenance uh, type of money and not really a, a, a viable um, component of construction of new roads. The HERF also has a distinctive um, a distribution system. Half of the money that comes to cities and towns um, for HERF, uh, half is divided in the same way that I described for um, state shared income tax and state shared sales tax. It's divided based on the incorporated population in the state. The other half is based on the uh, sale of gasoline in your county. So let me give an example. Let's say that $300 million are uh, collected for cities and towns from uh, the gasoline tax. 150,000 would be distributed based to cities and towns on the population process that I described in state share income and sales tax. Um, the other half would take uh, 150 and then they would look at the percentage of ga gasoline sold to uh, an individual county. So let's say we're talking about uh, Pima County and 10% of the total gasoline sold in the state is sold in Pima County. Then 10% of that 300 million or 30 million would be distributed amongst the cities and towns in Pima County. And they would take in, the cities and towns in Pima County, uh, their population figures would be added together, and then their percentage of that 30 million would be determined. So the idea behind how they split up HERF was that half of the money would be distributed on population and the wear and tear that population puts on roads, and the other half on gasoline sales, which if there's a lot of gasoline sales in a particular uh, area, that's supposed to mean that there are lots of cars traveling on highways there and they're stopping to buy gasoline. Um, that, those decisions were made back in the, in the 1970s and still apply today. The final um, uh, shared revenue system of the four is the vehicle license tax. Now the vehicle license tax is the tax that you pay to register your car. And um, again, uh, it has a, a different 
type of distribution system. Um, it is based on how many cars are sold and registered. Well, how many cars are registered back to um, the registrations that take place in Pima County. And let's say that 10% are registered there. Then 10% of the vehicle license tax monies uh, that go to cities and towns would be distributed to those incorporated cities and towns within Pima County. The vehicle license tax, like state shared income and sales, can be used for any general government purpose. So the highway user revenue fund has to be accounted for separately to show that it is being used for the purposes that are designated in state law. That's it for the state shared revenue uh, portion of what cities and towns receive. The other types of uh, taxes and fees that are available to cities and towns to raise the necessary revenue are, uh, uh, the next one in line is the local sales tax. All 91 cities and towns have a local sales tax. Um, there is a base uh, that cities and towns apply this to. There are 15 categories of tax. Um, the average sales tax uh, in the state of Arizona is 2.2%. Uh, the, the vast majority of cities and towns have a 2% um, sales tax. Uh, and the local sales tax is probably, to the larger cities and towns, the most important um, rev or most important revenue source that they have. Um, Smaller cities and towns depend more on shared revenue because they can't generate as much local sales tax as larger cities and towns do. Um, but it is important and that, that is why all cities and towns at some point have adopted a local sales tax. Now, the one question that I get most often when I talk about um, state shared revenue and about revenues available to cities and towns is, are my taxes going to go up? Now, the reason I bring this up when I'm going to talk about the property tax is that most county um, citizens that live in unincorporated areas um, don't um, have a local sales tax. They pay state sales tax, um, on, uh, but they don't have a local one. And so they think of their property taxes going up if there's a newly incorporated city. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, property tax, while available to cities and towns, can only be adopted through um, a vote of the citizens. And for the last 12 incorporations, um, there have been no primary property taxes uh, adopted. In fact, no property taxes at all. Um, I won't spend much time going in. We have another webinar that talks about uh, property tax. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that property tax is not as important a revenue source to cities and towns as it is to the counties. Uh, only half of uh, Arizona cities and towns, a little less than half, um, have no property tax. And, um, and so only a little over half actually have one in place. Some of them only have uh, what we refer to as a primary tax. Some have um, only a secondary tax and some have both. Uh, but it's actually a very small part on average of most city and town budgets. So the answer is, is that it's not likely that your property taxes are going to go up, but your local sales tax is going to be adopted. Um, that has happened in every single community. And so your paying local sales tax is going to happen. The one nice thing about the sales tax is that it usually is placed upon uh, not only people that live in the community, but also people that are passing through. Um, franchise fees have to do with utilities um, that uh, come into your area, uh, uh, cable franchises, uh, uh, natural gas franchises, um, electricity franchises. All of, all of those things can be franchised by the city and there's a process in place and uh, that's something that we can talk about, uh, that we usually talk about more in depth if the community actually becomes uh, incorporated. It's again, not a really important part of the budget, but it is one of the viable revenue sources that is still left for cities and towns. Also, um, cities that have a municipal court system and who have, who have 
um, local laws with uh, fines attached to them, you know, uh, can collect fines and forfeitures. Uh, that's also specifically stated in state law how those have to be used. Um, and so that's a, a longer explanation that we usually go into again after a newly, uh, after a community becomes incorporated. But it's not something that we tell them to include in their first or even second budgets. That's something that they look at in the future. Now, one thing that they may consider right away, right away is if they have a, um, a booming construction indus industry, especially when it relates to uh, residential homes, they want to, may want to consider development impact fees. Uh, development impact fees um, are just what they sound like. Um, there is a way for cities and towns to collect money based on the impact that um, a new home and the residents of that new home bring into a city or a town. And so there's ways to help pay for police, fire, roads, and uh, the important services that cities or towns provide. In past years, um, the ability for cities and towns to use impact fees in Arizona have been greatly curtailed, but it's still a viable um, option for cities and towns to use those. So those are the revenues that are available to carry out uh, the mandates that cities and towns have for services to be provided, plus any services that their citizens may want to adopt later on. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the pros and cons that we have heard over time from uh, citizens living in unincorporated areas as to whether uh, they should incorporate or not. The pros means that they have uh, more self-determination. Um, when they become a city or town, uh, they have the opportunity to have more an effect on things like how their area is going to develop. Uh, what kind of water resources it's going to have, what kind of services it's going to have. They have an ability to um, perhaps take a single service such as police service and pay for more of, of that service locally. Um, one of the things that we point out uh, to areas that are considering incorporation is that the counties like cities and towns do the best they can with the money that's provided to them. And so, um, but sometimes there's a desire locally uh, to pay um, for more of that and have more say over it and that and incorporation provides a, a way to do that. Um, there's the opportunity for them to share, uh, to gain greater shared revenue. Um, there are um, shared revenues that the counties get. Um, the counties continue to still to receive that shared revenue and um, unincorporated areas receive a share of what's going to other cities and towns. And so um, that is a way to bring more money into, the, into that area. Um, the city or town takes over the planning for, for and dealing with growth. Um, they take over the function of planning and zoning uh, from the county. And uh, they have, can have more say through their council about how their area is developed and they have standing and better representation with the courts, state, and with the federal government. Once the city or town becomes a government itself, their particular area has uh, obviously better representation there. Now, some of the cons we heard is that this is another unnecessary level of government. Uh, we don't need to have um, another level of government. We're fine with what the county provides. And, and what they do for us, and we don't see any need to change. Um, we don't want to pay more in sales taxes, and we don't believe that there's a sufficient sales tax base to pay for services maybe in our area. And we're afraid if that we incorporate our rural character may be lost. One of the things that I wanna say kind of in closing um, with pros and cons is that both of these um, feelings are legitimate points of view. One of the things that the league encourages as we make public presentations to both the proponents and the opponents of incorporation is that this should be something that brings the community closer together by discussing it. And whatever the community decides, it is a, an extremely um, personal, uh, for each individual, it's a personal decision as to what level of government they want to have. And 
when the decision is made one way or the other, it should be done with civility and it should be done with an idea that this is gonna bring us closer together and our community is gonna be stronger for it, whether we incorporate or whether we do not. And so uh, I just wanna state that the league is happy in being able to pro provide um, basic information about um, uh, incorporation. We don't encourage or discourage any community to incorporate. We simply want them to have the best information available. And if they do incorporate, to assist them in the early stages of becoming a city or town. Uh, that is all I have for today. It is always my pleasure to present uh, to our group. And if you have any questions about my presentation, please feel free to call the league and we'll be happy to walk th uh, through this information with you. We also have a very good um, uh, publication on our website. It's called uh, Municipal Incorporation in Arizona, and uh, it's a great uh, place to go and get your questions answered as well. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.